All right, so let's get started. We want to answer your questions. So we've submitted a survey out to everybody, gave you a link to be able to submit your questions. And you can continue to use that survey as things go on because I'm more than happy to answer questions as they come up for people. So let's just dive right in. And we're going to look at our first question, which is, can you create an action pattern so that Monday through Friday the customer gets an email and Saturday and Sunday it remains an alarm for the operators? Yes. Current functionality allows you to create two different action patterns and using the programming general schedule for Monday through Friday, days and times, using different action patterns and general schedules. Using the enhanced action patterns coming out in the fourth quarter, you're going to actually be able to do more of an if-then. So if it's Monday through Friday, email the customer and close the alarm. Else, use the G4 action pattern. So let me get myself over to my system and we can take a look at that. All right, so we have my Crafters Cafe customer here, and you'll see that we actually have an end schedule for emailing. So let me show you how that all worked out. So I gotta slide my little thing out of the way. So in my general schedules, I created a programming type general schedule for Monday through Friday between midnight and midnight. So it's just Monday through Friday, 100% of the day. You can always manipulate this, you can change, if you want to do just overnight or just during the day, you can certainly set those hours. That start and end one and start and end two allows you to make sure that one line encompasses only one 24-hour period. So for example, if I had done uh, from 7 a.m. or from midnight to 7 a.m. and then 7 p.m. to midnight, I would just have two entries here. I would have 0000, 0, 0, 0 0659 and then 1900 to 2359. So I have the ability to do all of that in one entry as opposed to having to do multiple lines for each possibility. So once I did that, I went back to my systems and my programming and I said, okay, my burglary alarm is going to be a burglary alarm in all cases with the exception of inside that schedule. Inside the schedule, it, which is that same general schedule I did, it's going to be a star BA as opposed to a regular BA. That way I can point it to a different action pattern. Then I can determine whether or not it should or should not be an alarm. I'm going to the default of, by default, a burglary alarm is an alarm. Then I went down to my event actions programming and said, if I have a star BA, I'm going to use a different action pattern than my regular burglary alarm G4 action pattern. So it's really very powerful and not super difficult to create. So we also have a document that goes over the general schedules. Um, I forgot to attach that to this particular group, but you will talk about the Bold Genius Resource Library in just a few minutes. All right, so that's our first bit. So question two. When using alarm handling, is it possible for new alarms to go to the operator first rather than expired suspended alarms? And the answer is yes. When suspending an alarm, it's a good practice to lower the dispatched alarm's priority. I usually teach people to double the number of the priority to maintain the same order, just lower on the priority list. So for example, if I have a priority one alarm, that becomes 11, two becomes 22, etc. So let me give you a little show of that. So in my alarm queue, I have a fire alarm that has not been touched, it has not been dispatched because I'm a really bad operator, but I have another one that was dispatched. So you can see I changed its priority so it's not going to, when it comes off of suspension or when it's ready, it's not going to overtake this higher priority older alarm. And all you're doing to, to manage this is you're just going to load up your alarm, you're going to do your actions as normal. So I'm going to do my fire alarm by fire company. I'm going to contact them. I'm going to put in my notes as far as what I'm doing and then maybe I need to place it on hold. So I can do hold and then suspend. And now in this I have a default interval set up in my event category so I have a 20 minute interval for this. And I can then set its alarm priority instead of to from 1 to 11 and once I do OK, it's now going to show on a lower priority. So I'm not going to keep my tracking. I'm going to get rid of that. And if we look now, we have two fire alarms that are priority 11, which is below this late to test, which is priority 10. 
So it maintains that priority as far as 1 is going to, 11 is going to be before 22, 22 is going to be before 33, etc. So you do have a lot of flexibility here. All right. And let's see, question number three. For existing central stations who want to utilize disaster mode but don't have it set up, what is the process to get it set up and what kind of issues and concerns should we look for, out for? Excellent question. Now, disaster mode has three key elements. You have to set your defaults in your event categories. Any specific override, sometimes that means you have to create new event codes in the event codes form and creating or updating your disaster events when they occur. So I'm going to once again flip over and we're going to take a look at that. So inside your supervisor workstation, which somehow I don't have open yet, so let me open that. Supervisor workstation is going to load and it's going to allow me to go into my event categories. So maintenance, events, and event categories. When I go in there, I'm going to see my disaster mode type for each category. So for example, I have uh, access alarms, I have a category for all of my different troubles, so I've separated my berg and my fire and, and medical troubles. So I have different behaviors based on that. You can be very flexible with your event categories. The important thing is that you want to always test to make sure that that's exactly what you want to do. Um, just to sort of point back to the suspend item, we actually have defaults set up in our event categories so that when I do do the file and suspend, I'm not just getting the one minute standard, I'm getting what is appropriate for that type of an alarm. But my disaster mode is created here. So for example, on my burglary alarms, I'm going to throw it in disaster mode so it's, it shows that I'm in the disaster mode for that particular account, and I'm going to offset its priorities. So for my burg alarms, they're going to be my priority, normally priority four in the manage to default install. I'm going to make them a five if they're inside the disaster area so that the burg alarms that are outside that disaster area are not being overtaken by the ones that are. So those are really helpful for that. You could even suspend for a period of seconds, just sort of delay its arrival to operators as well. I haven't found that as, as useful as just being able to offset its priority. So once I've created my categories, then I have to go into my event codes and just pick the things that are going to override. So when I go into maintenance, events, and event codes, you're going to see that I have all of these possible event codes. Most of them should be pointed to default, and default simply means go back to the event category and do what's there. So for example, my system alarms, if I go back to my event category there and look at my system alarms, it says auto log. So as long as that's acceptable, we're good to go. So that default is going to be there for most of your event codes. Then when you want to actually override, so I happen to have a high priority power failure here, this one, I'm going to put its, it in disaster mode, but I'm also going to keep its priority at two because my high priority power fails are ones that I'm overriding saying that maybe it's my egg farm, my blood bank, anything that's going to be a massive issue if we don't deal with it in disaster mode. So we can actually do those overrides there. So even though my system alarm was to auto log, I'm telling it that this particular event code that's programmed on specific accounts will be in disaster mode and its priority will be two. So you have a great power there to really establish what should be where in the alarm queue, even in a disaster event. So then once we're done with that, then we go back into our operator workstation and we are going to be able to create our actual disaster mode situation by simply clicking operations, then disaster mode. Once I select disaster mode, I can then click edit and add my disaster event. So I'm going to just say storms here. And you do need to have a comment in here, uh, National Weather Service notification, something like that. And you have the ability, if you have purchased additional monitoring groups, you have the ability to then select where should that go. And what that is going to do for us is it's going to be able to say, hey, operator two, I need you to log into this separate group and just deal with the stuff that's in the disaster area. So in this situation like with a Katrina or a Northeast power fail where you've got just massive, massive stuff coming, 
being able to pull that off, the stuff that's actually in the area, can be really useful. Now, once I have my monitoring group in place, I have the ability to set the country and the region, which allows me to then pick the zip codes that are applicable. So I can pick that city, and because my database is so small, I only have that one. Now, I also have to set for that time period. Am I doing it for hours, minutes, or am I doing it in the future? I have the ability to say, oh, I'm going to be prepared for that. Now, the warning and watch here. Watch means don't turn it on. Warning says it is active. We have a real disaster situation. So once all your elements are put into place, so I'm going to just do a five-minute uh, disaster mode here. Say OK, and I save. It has now committed this disaster event. Now, it's not going to start until tomorrow, so I don't have any overrides there. But if I did have a situation where my alarm queue was absolutely full of things that I don't want to deal with because they're in the disaster area, what I can do is I can do finish, operator cancel, validate my password, and you'll notice down here we have the disaster events. Once I select that disaster events, I can go back in time and apply a specific resolution code. Uh, we'll go with power loss here. And I can go back in time 10 minutes, I can go back 600 minutes, whatever it is, whatever it took to get us there into this disaster area. And once I put in my, my notes here about it, then I can update the alarm queue. It's going to scroll through the alarm queue, look for anything that occurred 10 minutes ago, and update and apply those disaster mode rules. So that's one of my favorite pieces of it, is the fact that you can go back and sort of reapply what's happening based on what you're looking at in your alarm, alarm queue. All right, so before I uh, uh, jump back into our next question, I'm going to review a few of these questions that have been loaded in here. So um, let's see. So we have a question about the action pattern suspend reprioritization reprioritization or default event suspend reprioritization. It would be nice uh, if, if you don't have to train the operators. That is something that we definitely have talked with our development team about. It is something that we are aware of that's, that's going to be important for you carrying forward. This is really sort of the way to do it now in the current Manitou version. I completely agree with you as far as, yes, it would be nice to be able to set that as a standard just like we do the actual suspend time. So I agree, and hopefully our development will um, start moving that direction when we get into the Neo version. All righty. OK, so now let's get on to our next question. Question four. How do you use, use the reminders feature, and how do you set it up in the transmitter type? First answer is the transmitter type is not where this occurs. It happens on individual customer records. They're designed to create alarms and or maintenance issues based on the customer need. So I'm going to pull back over here again. I'm going to pull up in my Crafters Cafe. And on my systems, I have a little node called Reminders. When I click Edit and validate my password, I can then add a reminder. Now you have two choices. So you can either create a signal or a maintenance issue. So it depends on your business practices which way you're going to go. I like to use signals because I want to use action patterns to send notifications. So I'm going to go ahead and pick my signal. And I don't know if I, remember, if I put in a reminder event or not. So let me see if I have not. All right, so I didn't create my um, reminder event that I wanted to do. So I'm going to go ahead and just pick a trouble here. And I'm going to say this is a daily check-in. It could be any event you want. You can create any events that you would like. So you have a lot of flexibility here. So daily check-in, not checking. There we go. And now I can say, it does it apply to a specific area zone? I can type in a different point ID. So we can say, for example, um, confirm, or actually, let's see, check in on Mrs. Johnson. Okay. I can also do a general schedule, or I can just say, when do I want it to happen? I want to have, have it start happening tomorrow at, for example, 9 o'clock in the morning. I want to randomize it so it delivers to any random person I want. So my randomize is going to be 
my interval minus and interval plus, you'll see here I can't click these little guys, but I can click these. So I can go, for example, 15 minutes before the top of the hour to 15 minutes after. And what that's going to do is it's going to run every one day. Now, if I don't have a service matching a one-day reminder service, I would then have to create that in my supervisor workstation. But once they're created, they will automatically, they should automatically pull, and you can add any notes. This, this notes is going to be the very first action item that they see in their action pattern. So you can actually put there, you know, please call, let the phone ring 10 times, anything like that that's going to help the operator properly ma manage this particular alarm. So once I do that and I save my record, now it says it couldn't find an exact match, so i got to go look at what I have. Oh, I have a 24-hour reminder, so we'll go ahead and, oh, two hour. We're going to do two hour. Why not? And then, once again, we just added reminder. Now, I have used this reminder service for all sorts of things. When I was managing a central station, I actually used this to sort of keep my operators active throughout the day. So I had this, I had a fitness alarm that they would go and they would be presented with a list of available um, exercises they could do. They could take five laps around the central station, they could do 10 squats, whatever it was that they wanted to do, and they just had to verify with another operator. That was a really huge uh, incentive for them as far as we actually had incentives for with points based, so they got points for every time they did it successfully, and we were able to really get people up and moving, which is so important in the central station. It's very difficult to get everybody up and moving. All right. So let me get myself back over here. All right, question number five. How do you configure a customer contact that must be contacted? Now this is actually occurs only in the call list. So you can do your call list, but you, have, you can only do that must contact in your call list. So I'm going to go into my customer record. I'm going to go to my contact list to make sure I have a few people on there. But a second here, yep, I've got Jane and John and Jeffrey and Hank. So what I can do is then create my call list. So I'm going to go down to call list. And I have my different call list. So I have a responsible parties list. Now, John Smith has to be contacted. So all I have to do is just when I'm in edit mode, I do need to select the individual and that they must be contacted. Now, if I was doing a rotation list within that list, I would then say maybe they do or don't rotate. Sometimes that's the last person you contact, but you have to contact them. So that in and of itself is going to just make that call list not satisfied until you actually have made that contact to the customer. Now, you do have an option in the supervisor workstation that has the call list must contact. So let me get that up here. So alarm handling. Call list must contact. If this is set to yes, I'm going to just hit my further description here. It requires a call list contact. It must be marked as contact action during the action pattern, even if the alarm is canceled. So that, that really is your big force. If you have to call this person before you close the alarm, this is the option for you. All right, so once I do that and I make sure that I've got my people as my must contact. Added must contact. Then I can do my, my testing to make sure that that call list is not satisfied until that time period exists or uh, that person is actually contacted. All right, take a little quick break and just look to see if there are any more questions related to the stuff I've just covered. No, no one. Okay. All right, so yes, you can create your call list, add your contact persons in the order they should be called, select the individuals that must be contacted, and check the box below. So if the company policy is to contact these persons before alarm closure, you will have to do the call, contact list must contact so that the option is set across the board. All right, question number six. When should I create a separate customer, create a main and sub account, create a master and related to master, multiple systems as opposed to multiple transmitters on one system? Now, I have attached to this particular meeting an attachment that has a customer, uh, customer record decision document. It's a quick reference document. It talks about each of these. So 
if I'm creating multiple accounts, think of it as if I, if I have a different address and I have to dispatch the police to a different place, then I need a different account. My main and sub account is where you have a single signaling panel and the multiple destinations where there may be different people to call, different uh, businesses, things like that. Master and related to master can be for campuses or other proximity of accounts that are related to them. So I generally use the you know, senior communities where you might have multiple buildings and you have your senior community where you've got your main building and that's my master account. And then the, the other buildings are related to it so that if multiple things happen from multiple locations, you have the tracking of what's happening with that. All right, and then the multiple transmitters, when everything is the same, zones, areas, et cetera, you can do multiple transmitters under one system. Multiple systems are going to be used when there are different zones, different areas, different users. So you might have situations where you have a digital dialer and a radio backup, but that radio backup only sends you four zones. That's going to be a separate system. But if I have a digital dialer and a radio backup where they are sending me exactly the same thing, just through two different paths, those can be two transmitters on the same, same actual system. All right, so I think there was another question here. Um, let's see, batch closing or operator cancel, is there a way to close alarms that have already been handled by the auto client? Um, example action patterns that are automatically sending out an email. Um, on the more recent versions of the 163 uh, Manitou, yes, absolutely, those can be cleared now. There's been some logic built into it but you have to be on the more recent versions of 163. I'm not exa exactly sure which update it was in, but I, when I had left our support department, I, we were on around 16, so I'm, I'm thinking it's about around there. So yes, you can definitely um, do that if you've got an automatic action, um, but you do need to be on the latest versions. Let's see. Um, boy, these, there's a lot of questions coming in, so I just want to make sure that I've Got the right ones here. Okay. All right. Um, we're just going to go to the next one, and then we'll have more questions at the end. All right. So we have question seven. I want to do two trip, but I don't want to. I want to have a different timeout than the global setting. How can I achieve the same thing? We have what's called confirmed command. So in your transmitter programming commands, you can actually. One, just like 2-trip where you can marry the zones together, you can use that confirmed command and set any specific timeout you'd like. So let me go ahead and pull up my Manitou system again. And if I go into my systems and my programming, I can actually use a confirmed command. So I'm going to go ahead and click edit here. And we are going to grab that confirmed. Okay, move it over, and the ID says these zones play together. So, for example, I might have my front door and my entry motion, those two play together, so they're going to be under ID 0, and then I might have back door and back door motion that are playing together. So that's what that ID is about. Then you say, when I get the confirmation, what event am I going to be? So, for example, if I've got a burglary alarm here, I'm going to do a verified burg so that I am... Very, I'm saying these two zones have confirmed that this is truly an alarm. And then I can set my timeout. It does default to the 300 seconds. And also, you always have that little thing that tells you a little bit more information, timeout period in seconds. So I can set this to 300 seconds. I can set it to you know, 15 seconds, depending on the need of the customer. And once that's in there, that is going to say, basically, I'm not actually going to trip uh, an alarm to you until this timeout has appeared and I have or have not received my confirmation. And when I do get confirmed, I'm going to be a burglary verified as opposed to just a burglary alarm. So I'm going to say added, confirmed, and I always put my notes because I need to be able to track what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it. All right, so confirmed command for that. So question eight. What are the differences between the suspend by time and the suspend until? This one can be a little confusing, so I want, to tell, I want to step through it. Suspend for time will release the alarm from suspension if the same event 
that means event code and zone, everything's exactly the same, arrives again. So if I have a fire alarm on zone one and that keeps coming in and I suspend it for five minutes every time or 10 minutes every time, it's going to then release that suspension if it continues to come in. Now the suspend until will keep the signal on hold until the release time defined. So if I am putting something on hold until tomorrow, until tomorrow at 1 a.m., 3 a.m., 7 a.m., whatever it is, it will stay on hold no matter how many times that individual event, zone, category, everything arrives. So it's got to be the exact same event. I did double check in this yesterday. It is only that single event that will be on hold until every other event does come in appropriately, priority notwithstanding. Um, so always remember that you, if you're doing it by time, Anything new that you get is going to be releasing that suspension time. If you do suspend until, it will stay there until the end. All right, we did get a question about the uh, difference between two trip and confirmed command. Two trip is just a global timeout and you just marry the zones together. So all you're gonna have is the zone itself and what, what zones play together. So that's just got a simple ID. And there's a global timeout. It's usually around 30 seconds by default. And then the confirmed command is adding a little bit more structure to it. It's allowing us to change the event based on the fact that we got the multiple trips confirming that this was an alarm. All right. Next one. What can the include command do for me? The include command allows you to actually insert specific action pattern, what I'm calling bytes, uh, when certain values are either true or false. So let me go ahead and pull up my system. I'm going to show you my global action patterns. Let's see them. And you'll see I have my G4 burg alarm. So my burg alarm is going to have these standards here. So if I step through and just look at my commercial, so my commercial action pattern byte says contact police and contact customer. My residential has contact customer and contact police because we do have a lot of people who are like, we're not doing anything residential unless we have some sort of verification at the site first. So my G4 says include global action pattern G4C when the qualifier is not residential or include global action pattern G4R if the qualifier is residential. And then I still have my contact, my responsible parties, and my close alarm steps in my regular action pattern. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you what these commands have. I'm not gonna step through absolutely every one of them because I could be here all day. But you do have the ability on your include, let me see, will it let me? No, it's not gonna let me. So for example, if a site's test time has expired, there's a difference between expired and taken off test. So if I'm a technician on the site and I say I'm going to be uh, testing this fire system for two hours, that two hours comes and goes, it softly returns to service, that's our signal handler saying two hours have expired, we're now going to bring you back into full service. If that time has expired and within the global setting, it's usually 20 minutes by default in your options, you can then change how that action pattern presents. Maybe I do a contact dealer if I'm a third party census station so that maybe we're reaching out to the site before we actually verify anything else or, or roll the fire trucks. Now if a, I'm a technician and I happen to use Voldnet Mobile or I use uh, any other way to put my account on test and I then go in and say I'm done testing that puts a hard stop on it. This site test expired will not apply because you've actually hard stop removed the on test. So that's a slight difference in that. Also, if in disaster mode, I did this massively when I had a, 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 a snowstorm that pretty much locked me into the central station for 36 hours. And I said, I had it set up so that if my account was in the disaster area, so in this tri-state area where the snowstorm was and the, the, nobody was going anywhere, then I would revert to my outbound open voice. So we would make a phone call and we had a standardized script that basically said that, you know, we're experiencing, uh, you know, weather related items in your area. This is your only notification of the alarm your low battery AC power fail, anything like that. And that reduced the volume of my operators having to actually 
make those phone calls even after the fact because we'd already made that phone call because we had this include command in place. Same thing with binary large object, uh, object available, you could do that. Um, you also have, for example, if the area is open or closed, as well as if something is being forced to an alarm. So I have the situation where I have maybe my um, are opens and closes that are, are normally just logged into my history, but something forced it to be an alarm. I could actually change my action pattern based on that. Same thing with my verify alarm. So that Berg verified that we just talked about with the confirmed command, I could actually use that saying if it's been verified, so it's a confirmed alarm, then I'm going to change my action pattern to dispatch the police first. So you have huge amounts of power just by this one little addition to our action patterns. And as I mentioned before, we are moving to a more if-then style of our enhanced action patterns, which we'll be uh, introducing during the um, users conference in August. So I hope to see you guys there because I'm really excited about it. All righty. So can I suspend specific alarms until the next morning but only for one dealer? Absolutely. So you can use the suspend until feature on the dealer level action patterns to manage for that. So let me jump over here to my account. I don't remember if I have a dealer tied to this so I'm just going to open a dealer record and open the one I know I have. And so in my action patterns, I can then build any sort of action pattern I want. So I could, for example, I have a post alarm that sends an email notification after the closing of an alarm. Um, but I can actually do a suspend until. So for example, I might want to actually not send that particular contact report until the morning. He doesn't want to have his email blowing up all night. So I can actually go down to my suspend and pick suspend until. I want to say what time of night I'm going to start. So I'm going to start at 10 o'clock, so I'm going to change that to 22. And I'm going to suspend until 6 o'clock in the morning when he's actually going to get that. I go ahead and select all days of the week because it's just a good practice. And when I add that command and move it to the top, it's going to, once an alarm is closed, it's going to suspend that notification until 6 a.m. and then it's going to send the contact report to the dealer. So you have a lot of flexibility doing that. You can also on the dealer under their programming, there we go, under our programming, we can actually say which events are going to have that. Now I had this tied to my burglar alarm so that I had my action ID, but you can do this to individual events. So for example, maybe my star LT is one that I'm actually just going to email a notification to the dealer. So I can then grab that same action pattern and it's still going to work just the same, but I'm probably going to add my close command because this one would be an alarm in the alarm queue as opposed to a closed alarm. All right. And question 11. Um, it's about the batch cancel. Is there something in the supervisor workstation that needs to be selected to make it work? Um, I have not been able to close more than one alarm at a time, even with selecting all of the criteria. Uh, and can we do a demo? Absolutely, we'll do a demo. Batch cancel will only work if the alarms are priorities 5 through 99. Anything 4, 3, 2, or 1 will not be able to be batch canceled. Also, it cannot be action. So those of you who are on some of those older versions where sending that email flags it as action, you're going to want to get updated to the latest so that you can make sure that that's going to work the way you want it to. So I'm going to go ahead and demo what that be behavior is like. So I'm going to cancel that. So in my alarm queue, I've got 10 fitness alarms that I am going to just bug out. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to click Finish and Operator Cancel. I'm going to enter my password, and you see that it's, it stretches them all out. But I can actually go by event code. So if I had a list of my event codes, I can, oh, this is new, <laughs> include action items or include suspended alarms. That's fabulous. So we can actually tick those boxes if we need to. And then we always have to give it an appropriate resolution code for what it is. And then we put in our reason. Okay. And once I do that, I can cancel my alarms. And it always tells me I have to be an alarm handler to do it because I'm only an alarm handler in the alarm form. So it makes me an alarm handler long enough to clear those out. 
but that's new in the latest uh, update because I have not seen that before and I just taught the uh, Central Station Manager course so I've been in there quite a bit. So very exciting for anybody who is uh, getting close to the most recent versions you want to go ahead and also follow up with that to get updated to the latest. We, I think we released patch 23 at this point. All right, when a pre-cancel alarm is entered and sent, can Manitou have the ability to auto-cancel the alarm instead of another operator having to do it? Currently, no, but uh, perhaps someone's calling to pre-cancel for only fire alarms, that type of thing. It's really risky at this point to do that based on the current pre-cancel. But if you want to submit a feature request, include a business case for why this should behave the way you want it to, and we will definitely put it in consideration once we get the Neo version out. So um, it is, I understand where you're coming from. You want to be able to clear them out so that nobody has to actually touch it, but there is some risk involved. So we want to make sure that we address those risks first. All right, so I'm going to go back to our questions a little bit and see what we've got here. Um, and I don't know if Bryant wants to chime in on anything specific that he saw that... Uh, there's one on post alarms. Okay. All right. Post alarms. Uh, okay. All right. Um, set up for an email notification based on the event resolution instead of by event. Uh, that is currently not the functionality of it, but it is something that uh, we've had a few people sort of feedback on. Once again, I would suggest doing a feature request for that because it is a valid request. You can do it based on zone on the customer record, but as far as um, the event resolution, that's not currently it. However, that being said, our enhanced action patterns is going to allow us to do quite a bit of if then. So if this resolution code, then send the post alarm, if else, do something different. So I think we will have the ability to do it once we get those enhanced action patterns rolled out. Okay. Let's see. All right. So let's go on to the next thing, which is our resources. Where can you find your own answers? So first and foremost, I want to introduce you to our Bold Genius Resource Library. Okay, the documents that I've attached to this particular um, Coffee with Manitou section are examples of what's available, but that is actually just found in the Bold Genius Resource Library. So let me go ahead and pull up my browser. Okay, and so it might kick me out, I might have to re-log in. But the Bold Genius Resource Library is right after you log in to Bold Genius, okay, you can start browsing. And this is actually so that you can browse by category, okay, you can browse by date, how, what are my most recent items. You can also browse by alphabet. So if I'm looking for something to troubleshoot, I might go to T and see what I have. So for example, I have the troubleshooting the failed to update VB user control. This is when I get a new update and maybe all my workstations didn't actually get updated. So I double click to log in and all of a sudden it says failed to update VB user control and everybody goes, what's that? This is actually going to have your example and how to troubleshoot it and how to fix it. Same thing with the Manitou System Manager. If I'm a uh, IT person, my MSM doesn't start. It could be a bunch of different things, but the most common thing is going to be that the service it has caught, especially after an update. You might have an update where your Manitou Monitor service is running and you get the update and you have to sort of kick it in the head or restart it to get it to reopen your Manitou System Manager. Same thing, I've done a Manitou workstation installation and I can't see it in the supervisor workstation or the workstations, or I can't see it in the distributor commander to send the most recent stuff. So you do have a lot of helpful quick references. Right now there's about 45 documents in there, it's growing every day. I usually update and add new uh, items probably at least five times a week, so technically daily, but sometimes I might do five on Friday. So we are constantly updating this. You have the ability to browse by category. So for example, I want to look for just my trainer resources. So I select that and it's going to show me all the documents that I have that are tied to a trainer resource. So we have these categories to make your life easier. Now when you first come in to 
the Bold Genius Resource Library and you click this, it's going to tell you you have to enroll. You're allowed to self-enroll. All you have to do is say, enroll me. Now, this is inside the Moodle rooms for Bold Genius. So, every site does have access to three free users for Bold Genius, and then you can purchase a specific level carrying forward if you want more. So, this is one of your first resources to go to. Um, to actually start uh, looking for your answers, getting your ans questions answered. How do I do can cancel? How do I uh, do a restore required? All here in your Bold Genius resource library. Um, the link for Bold Genius is actually going to be boldgenius.mrooms.net. Um, you feel free to email boldgeniussupport at boldgroup.com. If you want to verify that you do have your free users and that your system's set up, and I can also, we can set you up at any point in time. So feel free. That is boldgeniussupport at boldgroup.com. All right. Some of your other resources that you have are the Bold Support Portal. So I'm going to just flip back over to my browser. Let's see. There we go. And we have the Bold Support Portal. And we have a knowledge base. So you have the ability to see all sorts of things. The most important thing I wanted to point out is, how do you actually submit things to support? The biggest thing that I have run into as somebody who's been in support is getting details. If we don't get details, it slows down the ability for us to determine and resolve your problem. So we've actually created a knowledge base article that talks about how to get your support uh, tickets managed as quickly as possible. Recently, I actually saw one that basically said, uh, we have an, we just saw an error that reads, uh, could not find caller ID. That's it. No customer record, no any premise behind it, what they, were they trying to do, anything like that. It was just, here's the error message, tell us what it is. And you actually have the error message, I believe, in the knowledge base. So it is something that you can use this knowledge base. And when you log in, you're going to be able to go in and view your knowledge base. You're also going to have the ability to search. So you have a massive amount of, we have 109 Manitou knowledge base articles that will also be turned into quick reference guides. So you do have uh, both resources for being able to troubleshoot things on your own. Are the documents the same between Bold Genius and the support knowledge base? Well, some of them are specifically support items, so they're going to be different. We also are moving a lot of our documentation into our new Bold Genius format. So while the data might be exactly the same, the look and feel will be different. So thank you for bringing that up, Ian. Um, here are some examples of what we have. So for example, I have my auto notify for open close events. What steps do I need to do? How do I do it? And where to make all of these changes? Creating a maintenance issue, we, our maintenance plan for SQL Server. We actually have a how-to document that includes images on how to create a maintenance plan in SQL Server. It's not really a bold purview, but it is a way that you can help self-help to create your own maintenance plans. Um, adding a new receiver. These are the steps, and it also goes into the, some of the troubleshooting, some of the items that could happen when you're not able to see that receiver through the ports that you have configured. We also have a great little simple data entry document. This is going to step you through all of the steps just to get a customer into Manitou. It doesn't have all of the each individual element. It's just here are the steps, here are the places to go to get a customer entered where you can receive an alarm, notify the site, dispatch the police. So that's a really helpful tool. We also have the script messages. How do I get a user's name in a script message? So you have access to all of these documents through the Bold um, Genius Resource Library. All righty. And let's see. That's all we have today. Woo, I talked for 45 minutes straight. So let's go ahead and see if there are any items else that I, I can deal with right here and now, and anything that we don't get answered will be answered in our follow-up email. Um, now, the Bold Support Portal will contain the support-related items. 
training will be in the Bold Genius Resource Library. But um, once you sign up on that Bold Genius Resource Library, you'll be getting email notifications for any updates, anything new. Um, you probably want to put a filter in your emails because it will be quite busy over the next few months. Um, let's see. We talked about that. So it looks like, unless there's any more questions, we, we can sit here for a little bit. Um, you will be able to review this webinar. Uh, you'll get a link. Actually, it will be a downloadable link in your email tomorrow as a follow-up with this recording. So that's also barring any problems with a computer crashing it. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to leave this open for a few more minutes so that people can t continue to ask some questions. And if you have anything that you uh, would like to follow up on, remember, there's that Google link. Um, that was in your initial Bold Genius email, feel free to submit questions to there, there anytime. Let's see. Um, are you able to globally automatically suspend a specific event on a global level? Um, not the event codes themselves. What the automatic suspend time is just for the event category. So when an operator goes into that hold and suspend, they'll actually have a default amount of time set. Um, I don't know that anybody has looked into that as far as a feature. It's not one that I'm familiar with, but I would encourage you to uh, email Bold Talk and see if anybody's done that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Any questions that don't get answered here today, uh, we will get a follow-up email, and we will follow up with all of those details. Once again, look for the recording tomorrow in your email. Thanks so much, everyone.